Um, welcome everyone and um, welcome to episode episode 74 um, where we're going to have a bit of a deep dive into gout um, and uh, there's, there's way more than an hour's worth of, of talking about gout but we're going to try and cram as much as we can in and we are utterly delighted to have Professor Keith Rome with us. Thank you Keith for joining us and giving us some of your time. Quick introduction, um, you should know who Keith is I'm sure but uh, forgive me if I get this wrong Keith but a still, a still an associated professor with AUT in New Zealand a visiting professor at Southampton University because you're now back in the UK the editor-in-chief of JFAR which there's just nowhere near enough time to go through your published work it's just it's just reams and reams and reams of it um we're totally totally delighted to have you and 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 uh sort of delve into your brain and, and, and ask lots of questions about gout and and, uh, and its associated sort of um things as well so thanks for joining us and let's just get straight into the questions i had loads of questions come in on the emails when i announced this episode a popular one i think um with students uh new grads and and you know uh, experienced podiatrists alike and we might as well start at the beginning and just go straight back to uh, one question that came in which was what is gout uh, and then the 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 sub question there was could you just talk a little bit more on the on the cellular level about the deposits within the joint and this sort of this crystal arthritis that we know it to be? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me in the first instance, and uh, the great pleasure to, to talk about gout. And um, gout is something I really only experienced when I first moved to New Zealand about 13, 14 years ago, and I was um, privileged to be invited to a a large rheumatology clinic in, in Auckland where gout patients came in and my vision of gout was that it was always an older person, a Caucasian sitting and having a glass of port with his foot up and I say he and I come back to that in a moment and um, having this rich lifestyle and when I went to the clinic I was amazed to see that it was the complete opposite, to see a whole range of people with gout, with very young people with gout, as well as old people with gout. And to go back to the question, what is gout? Gout is a condition which is often seen in the foot, particularly the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. But we talk about it being an acute episode, it has something called a monoarthritic issue, i.e. only affects one joint, but what we've seen, it affects other joints as well. And it's caused by the accumulation of uh, sodium urate crystals. And these crystals deposit not only in bone, but also in soft tissue as well. So that perception that it only affects joints is probably only part of a much bigger story. And work has been conducted, not only looking at particular joints like the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, but also the Achilles tendon and how it impacts on that particular function. But it also affects other parts of soft tissues as well, particularly related to the foot and ankle. So, it is a condition where you do get an accumulation of the sodium urate crystals, which form something called a tophus. And a tophus is like a, a pocket of these crystals which form together and they accumulate and that over a period of time become inflamed. And when you get an acute episode and then they, the acute episode wears off and then over a period of time, it becomes a chronic problem. And that is your traditional classical feature of someone with gout. Great. Could we lean uh, on a few things you've, you've said there, Keith, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Th first off, you, you, you started off with that assumption of the, the classic presentation, which I think we've all had at some point. And yes. one of the questions that did come in was, is there a greater prevalence in a particular demographic? So I think that probably speaks to some of the things you said there. Could we go into that in a bit more detail? Yes, certainly. Um, I, what the evidence has shown and what we have seen and observed in, in our clinics is that there is a higher prevalence in men compared to women. And perhaps the, the latest UK figures illustrate approximately a four to one 
ratio. So it's more prevalent in men than women. The age group is a very, very interesting one. Um, the experience I've noticed in New Zealand, it is a wide range of people. And it's not necessarily the older population, although a lot of the research and the evidence coming out from New Zealand, from Australia, from America, as well as UK, it is the older adult. And as you get older, interestingly, it impacts more on women than it does on men. So you have this mixed evidence, but for students, I think it's easy to remember that it's more in men than in women. Now, in terms of eth ethnicity, now what has been found and what we observed in New Zealand in particular, it was high in Maori and Pacific Island people. And I'm sure in Australia, uh, Torres Strait people, Aborigines, have a higher incidence of gout versus Caucasian. And in America, Black African Caribbean uh, people have a higher incidence of gout as well. So there is, there is this difference in ethnicity and how it impacts gout. But a very, very interesting study which was undertaken by colleagues at um, Keele University here in the UK, looking at prevalence and incident rates, illustrated that there are two geographic areas of, of Britain which have got a higher prevalence than the rest of the country, and that is the northeast of England and South Wales. Wow, interesting. Why? I, we, they just don't know. But that's the figures which are coming out. Great. And um, you made reference to someone living um, a rich life, a good life. Yes. You know, we, we, life, we have yes. this, you know, we have the visions of, you know, port and, um, and good steak and things. Um, when we're talking about what causes gout, uh, are we, is that, that still very much part of the discussion or is it more linking towards the hereditary link or is there, is there a, a shared sort of um, responsibility there? I think it's a very good question. It, it is multifactorial like many of these long-term chronic conditions. And when we talk about diet, we classically think about high purine diets. So high purine like in meat, uh, but also what we mustn't forget is also alcohol, uh, selfish. They have been from a dietary perspective it is indicating that these people do have more of an attack of gout when they have high amounts of these high purine uh, foods. But what is more disturbing and, and I think people should be aware of, drinking fructose or su and sugar sweetened soft drinks can also accelerate that person getting an acute attack. Okay, and, interesting. And um, it's, it's, it, if you think from a, a socio-economic perspective, is that these sugary, high sugary sweetened soft drinks are, are very inexpensive to buy. And it's, and, but people do drink it. And accumulation over a period of time does lead to acute attacks. Interesting, okay. But on the opposite side of the coin is that if you drink coffee and perhaps vitamin C actually reduces the incidence of gout attacks. Okay, that's good to know. That's, that's, that's always pleasing to know, isn't it? Yes. Uh, coffee. That's a big coffee drinker myself. So um, could we also talk about um, some of the associated comorbidities and the clinic, the overall clinical picture of gout rather than just considering it as a, as a sort of, um, as a condition that may present in isolation? Yes, certainly. I think um, everyone just thinks that when a person gets gout, that is it. They don't have any other conditions associated with it, but it's quite the opposite. We see many patients with gout having other um, diseases or comorbidities associated with, with gout. Um, hypertension, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease is a very sinister condition which is associated with, with gout. Type 2 diabetes, obesity, 
and the classical metabolic syndrome, which is where you get high hyperlipidemia, insulin resistance and, and hypertension. All these have been associated with gout. So when, you're, when a, a clinician is asking the patient or they're you know, about gout, I think they, when they should be taking their history, you may find that one of these comorbidities may come up as well. And that has a, a way of thinking about how do I manage this person? Is it purely that I'm trying to deal with the gout or am I live, dealing with lifestyle changes? Yeah, sorry, Keith, can I just backtrack a moment? They're just going back to the, to the lifestyle kinds of issues. I just want to, let me just share this. This was something from a blog post from December 2018 that I actually shared on Twitter at the time. And it, it is gout a consequence of lifestyle choices or mainly mm -hmm. genetics. And it was just commenting on this particular study here. Can you, you um, the evaluation of diet wide contribution to serum urate yes. levels? I don't know whether you recall that study, um, but it was a meta analysis. So what they said, in contrast with genetic contributions, diet explains very little variation in the serum urate levels. And mm. that really jumped, that study really jumped out at me because I, my assumption was, you know, my, there's a huge um, dietary lifestyle component to it that study is pretty much showing well genetics is the biggest component genetics as we know it's, it's a very good point and uh, thank you for reminding me that genome associations with gout are in their infancy and they've started to look at some of the urate uh, transporters either yeah. try to dissolve mm. the urates in, in the kidney or, or, or the gut and what is what they are finding that there are certain loci or certain genes that have been associated with gout and a lot of work or more recent work and it's still in a very infancy the developmental stages are starting to identify these certain genes which are associated with gout and from a pharmace pharmaceutical point of view they're very interested particularly the companies in looking at gene therapy based on current work, which is actually being undertaken. And it may well be in a few years time, what they are discovering or finding out now may be associated with genes. We know, for example, in, in Maori population, there is a, 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 a gene missing, which can break, break down the U8 levels. So that's a, an illustration of, of what, what yeah. is going. But it's at a very, very early stage, and it's um, it's yeah. start, the evidence is starting to support those ideas. Yeah. I'll I'll ask the question now, but we'll answer it later on when we get to treatment. But to me, that raises a question about the extraordinary emphasis being placed on diet and lifestyle factors. But we'll come back to that when we get to treatment. <laughs> let's um, let's get straight to the money shot, the big question, the one that we that everyone always asks. Um, if these facts are still accurate, I'm not sure, so correct me if they're not, but 75% of primary gout attacks affect the big toe joint, the first metatarsophalangeal joint. Um, the big question on everyone's lips, what, why this joint? <laughs> it's the $64,000 question. Good for, it's a very good <laughs> With One of my um, PhD students who now is working at, in a medical school now, she did a systematic review and she found that 75%, 72% of those people, or all the studies which have been undertaken in gout, the first metatarsal phalangeal joint is the, the one which has been impacted the most. There are other joints, and I'll come back to the theories of why in a moment, but the midfoot, approximately 60% of people um, have gout at the midfoot. The lesser toes is a very common area, again, approximately 60%. The hallux itself, about 50%. If you talk about the heel, about 45%, and the ankle, about 50% or 50%. So it doesn't necessarily affect the first metatarsal phalangeal joints, but it affects other joints and soft tissue within the foot and ankle. It does also affect the knees, the elbows as well, and the hands in particular. We've seen a lot of people with uh, gouty tophi or gouty arthritis 
particularly in the fingers. So the big question is why? Why the big toe in particular? And it's very much theoretical. And there's one or two theories which are being put around to, to reasons why. One is low temperatures because it's a peripheral joint and therefore the ura crystals form under low temperature. That's one theory put forward. Biomechanical stresses could be another reason. And we have found through a, a number of studies we've undertaken that people with gout do have biomechanical uh, changes related to the foot and ankle. So kinematics as well as kinetics, so the forces and the pressure applied to certain joints are changed, are altered as a person walks. We find that there is a decreased movement, motion at the ankle joint. There are decreased movements in ankle joint plantiflexion, dorsiflexion, inversion, eversion at the joints of, of, of the rear foot. So there is limited range of movements at the majority of weight bearing joints within within the foot. So there's a lot of evidence supporting that it could be biomechanical stress. Another theory put forward is it could be due to physical trauma, either repetitive micro trauma over a long period of time. Hence, poor footwear, as an example, could be a contributing factor to the reason why a wide foot, for example and a very narrow shoe could be a, 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 a one of the factors, but it could also be a single macro traumatic event. Could and occur. I also, and again, I, I'm not sure the evidence supporting this, that the, the pH is lower in more distal joints. Is that? Now this is a study undertaken back in, you'll like this one, Craig, back in 1979, mm -hmm. we put forward the idea of that. And now this is, a yeah. done under the laboratory setting okay. but it still stands as, as a theoretical reason for the reason why whether it's the main one who knows yeah. but there is one other factor which does come into play which i leave to the last and that is degenerated cartilage is also a factor so what we find is that a lot of people with gout also have osteoarthritis now what comes first is we're not quite sure whether the osteoarthritis leads to the gout or gout leads to degenerative changes at the cartilage. Who knows? But that's another theoretical reasoning behind why the first metatarsal phalangeal joint is the most prominent joint within the foot uh, with, yeah. associated with gout. Yeah, I think it was Edward Roddy was the one that was pushing the, the sort of the OA angle. And yes, if yes. I was to, which one do you think it is? What's your best guess? Oh, um, I think like many, I'm going to sit on the fence here, like many things, because it's multifactorial, yeah. I'll say again, it's multifactorial. Yeah. I think it's a number of events put together, like mm. a trigger, which leads to a person getting gout. If you put into the equation or the mix diet or some kind of other episode which is occurring, then the person to get an attack is likely to, to get an acute episode. I mean, at the end of the day, it could be all of them. It could be the temperature, could be the yes. pH, could be the trauma, and it's just correct that the, all of them correct that environment that, you know, add in the genes and the diet, bang, you know, it's... <clears throat> Very much so, it, it is, and that's the reason, and that's why the, there isn't one stronger theory than another. Keith, you mentioned the low temperature theory. We just had a yes. comment from um, Andrew saying, would the low temperature theory also, would, would that be consistent with why gouty attacks seem to occur more in the middle of the night? Um, I, oh, that's a very good question. I haven't really thought about that. So thank you, Andrew, for that question. Um, oh, possibly, but I, I I have not seen any evidence to support that kind of claim, but it, it sounds logical, but um, low temperature, potentially, yes, that, that, that could be a, a reason, but um, as I said, it, it could be any of those factors which I've uh, talked about. 
Yeah, but, but yeah. I also think, Keith, in the night, the lower temperatures in the environment would affect all joints, not just the one particular joint yeah. that's more common. In. Yeah. And I think we're talking more about the temperature of in that joint compared to other joints is, is lower because yes. it's more distal, yeah. And um, the thing that fascinated me is what the, some of the stats you just threw at us, Keith, was the, the midfoot, 60%, um, mm. not, not an insignificant uh, number. Um, question for you, if we have a patient presenting clinic, you know, with, a, with an inflamed big toe joint, whether we're a, a third year student, a new grad or an experienced podiatrist, we ask a group of podiatrists, give us your top three differentials. And it's reasonable to assume that gout probably makes that top three in an inflamed big toe joint uh, a presentation of midfoot pain we ask people for their top three differentials why aren't more people i'm uh, making an assumption gout probably doesn't make that list for most of us why aren't more people thinking gout when we're thinking midfoot pain actually keith <laughs> be sorry before you answer that keith i just, I, I just got a little comment i i've a, a colleague of mine quite a few years ago who i have a lot of respect for so said to me that the most common cause of midfoot pain is gout now, there's obviously no evidence numbers to put on that, but it, it was someone who I actually respect. And I thought, oh, okay. Now, I can only recall in recent times seeing it twice. So either they're wrong or I'm missing it or somewhere in between. So I'd sorry to interrupt before you answer the question. But no, I'll just, put not, that little comment in there. <laughs> not at all. It's, it, it's, it's an interesting thought because most people, when they look at the midfoot, and they would automatically think that you're dealing with osteoarthritis because of the degenerative changes at that joint. But what we found was in some plantar pressure studies we undertook that the midfoot in particular showed an increase in, in, in pressure at that particular point where it's trying to offload from the, the term, for example, the hallux or the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So going back to your question is, is there more likelihood of having someone with gout at the midfoot than just your classical degenerative osteoarthritis? The answer is we don't really know the answer, simply because imaging studies have looked at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint and perhaps they've looked at soft tissue, for example, the Achilles tendon, not necessarily the midfoot. So we don't really know the answer. We, we assume that if osteoarthritis is occurring and the person's got a history of gout, let's say at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, it doesn't necessarily rule out that they haven't got tophus at the midfoot as well. It's what you're looking at is that, you know, you, if, if you had the opportunity well imaging the foot the image would most, most definitely be looking at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint and all the changes which occur in there so ultrasound musculoskeletal ultrasound is used to look at imaging in terms of some of the classical features cat scans are used x-rays are not used anymore because it doesn't give you a true representation of what's actually going on there out there they talk about a punched out erodive area using x-ray but it doesn't tell you about soft tissue changes some of the blood changes as well around the the cartilage as well so really um the research has focused on the first metatarsal phalangeal joint and ankle but not the midfoot sure i know keith i know that the two that i saw recently um clinically they turned up with that classical midfoot dorsal mechanical compression syndrome the their yes. description of it was a hundred percent consistent with that the only difference was it hurt at night mm. and that that was the giveaway that was you know that they were getting pain non-weight bearing so there was obviously but everything was t so typical of a mechanical problem in their description yeah. my assessment everything except it was in those particular and you know, went on to further investigations and yeah, it was gout, you know, so that was the giveaway was the pain. With, with the pain. Um, and I tell you what, if, if I'd slipped up in the history take and missed that, you, I could have gone down a totally different pathway. Mm, that's an interesting one. So yes, it goes back to, you know, what do we know of so far? And if you go with clinical presentations and the person's got a history of gout, then yeah. maybe that's an indicator of red flag that they may have gout in that particular joint. 
Yeah, well, those two had no history of gout. This was their initial presentation, which was, so, you know, was a, but like I said, mm. it, it's two and 10 years, you know, like, you know, <laughs> not exactly a common problem. But we just did a comment um, actually from Kevin Kirby. He's, he's seen many patients where their gouty attack started in the ankle um, and they had, they had no pain in the MPJ and he's really seen gout in the midfoot. So yeah, it's like, it's, it's not, not an MPJ problem. <laughs> So as I say, the majority of studies talk about the first metatarsal phalangeal joint as being the, 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 the biggest joint yeah. associated with gout in the, in the body, not just mm. simply in the foot. Well, did, you, did you mention the numbers? Was it 70% or something or 70? Uh, exact number is actually 72%. 72. Of okay, gout yeah. studies have recorded first metatarsal phalangeal joint involvement. Mm. Can we talk a bit about what what it presents like acutely just so that you know people can be familiar with um you know seeing this thing in clinic so uh, an, an acute set, sort of episode of gout what would we expect that to, to look like clinically uh an acute episode would be something which and i think we talked a little bit about this beforehand is something that if a person ever suffers from it they will experience they will tell you about that particular experience it's like uh, women giving birth to a child it's that you know it's a very acute experience it's very um inflamed it is very red it is very swollen and nothing can touch that joint so one of our very first studies was that we wanted to obtain what kind of pain and impairment and disability people with an acute attack were suffering from so our study was based at an A&E hospital in Auckland and we recruited over a long period of time, perhaps nearly 18 months, perhaps 20 patients. And we had to go into the wards at the hospital because people ended up going on the wards. So you can imagine the, the cost involved in having someone being hospitalised because of an acute attack is that a lot of people didn't want to be involved in the study because they were in so much agony and pain that the last thing they wanted was a, a researcher asking questions, how bad is your pain? But some people <laughs> did, thank goodness. And um, we, what we did is that we measured their pain levels and no surprise, they were extremely high. So if you took a, a visual analog scale of zero with no pain and 100, pain out of this world, most people were towards the 80, 90, 100 mark. So immense pain. That pain over a period of days and weeks subsided. And when we measured them again, eight weeks later, their pain levels hadn't actually reduced down to zero. They still had this residual pain. So they still had high level, well, relatively high levels of pain even after the acute attack so pain is a classical feature of someone experiencing gout as i said the, the features is red hot swollen joints so in other words keith it's almost as painful as man flu <laughs> Um, you, the, <laughs> um, no, no, I, 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 we talked about this before we came on my get lecture on gout to the students I, my very first slide is a quote from anonymous and i'll post this quote in the comments and it, it, the, the quote is you put your finger in some vice grips it's a very old quote so you put your finger in some vice grips you screw it up as tight as you can and you have rheumatism give it another half turn and you have gout and and you know the the, the point of that quote is you know gout hurts <laughs> and I, I think you know, I have a patient, I have, you know, patients quite regularly and a little bit of ache in their big toe and they said, have I got gout? And I said, well, no, <laughs> you know, it's, it's it, gout is hurts. It's not a little ache in the big toe joint, you know. <laughs> I mean, making an assumption that someone in that level of exquisite pain may not want to leave the house, may not want to visit the clinic. It therefore I think becomes important in our history taking when someone presents with a painful big toe and they say it's been bothering me for three weeks to ask those questions what what was this like three weeks ago because it could yeah. well be that that, that, that sort of you're, you're missing the acuteness because they, they just weren't willing for anyone to even to, they don't want anyone to they don't want to think about anyone touching this let alone you know assessing it properly 
Could you talk a bit more about what we might expect the present presentation to look like post acute episode or perhaps the consequences of repeated episodes or, or what this may look like with greater sort of chronicity, you know, a longer timeline? OK, it's interesting to, to reflect on the, the continuum of gout because we, we've, we talk classically about acute attacks and we talk about the chronic tophaceous gout. So those are terms we use. So you have an acute attack and over a period of many years, it becomes chronic and becomes tophaceous. So that tophaceous, so you have tophus within the joint itself. What you have is something called a precursor to acute gout, something called hyperuricemia or asymptomatic hyperuricemia. So that's like a precursor to an acute attack. Now, our evidence of asymptomatic hyperuricemia is starting to develop. There are many, many people out there in the UK, in Australia, New Zealand, in America in particular, who have this asymptomatic hyperuricemia. And it's like a precursor to before they develop an acute attack. So they have high urate levels, sodium urate levels. That will potentially develop into an acute attack, but not everyone with asymptomatic hyperuricemia will lead to an acute attack. And I don't know the percentage, but perhaps maybe 10% approximately get an acute attack. Once they have an acute attack, then they will have episodes or intermittent gout where for many weeks or months or years, no attack occurs. And then suddenly they get an episode. Now it could be due to trauma, it could be due to diet, there are reasons or unknown reasons I should say, on why suddenly they should get another an attack. That vicious cycle continues on of these acute attacks, intermittent attacks, and it gradually over a period of years, it becomes chronic. And then you get the classical chronic to faceless gout where you get a fixed joint, very limited range of movement. Um, you get this quite bulbous feature of a tophus which sits on the joint or within the joint itself or around the soft tissue. And that is your classical chronic to face the scout. So yeah. it goes through different phases. Yeah. Actually, just, just on that, Keith, my, my limited understanding of the physiology is that you've got high, um, high ur urate acids in the blood. And really what gout is, is the body's attempt to, to lower that by sticking them in the joint. Yes. So what I'm leading up to, if that, that is the case, any blood test for urate levels is not going to be that good because the body's just lowered it by sticking the urate into the joint. Is that correct? Or um, oh gosh, it's a bit more complicated. Than, I said than my that. limited understanding. You know, <laughs> see, there are um, there are certain blood tests which can be taken, which will give you urate levels. Now that will indicate that you've got high. You know, sodium urate levels in, in the blood. Does that mean that that person has got gout? It may not necessarily be the case. So blood tests are not necessarily the definitive way of coming up with a diagnosis. Aspirating a joint and then sticking the, you know, the, the fluid in a microscope, a light or polarized microscope will give you a definitive diagnosis of, of gout. And that's how they come up with a diagnosis. So it's, you know, they, they will see the crystals that's perfectly timed, under the microscope, under light microscopic, light or polarised microscopic. The next two questions uh, that had come, well, or the, in the order that I'd written them down as they came in, one was someone who'd heard that bloods weren't that uh, valuable because, you know, someone goes to the GP, they have bloods and they're told my uric acid levels are normal, um, which um, quite often can be the case during it, during the episode. And then another one was how do we diagnose that? Is it by aspiration blood assay or is there, is there any, um, any comment you have on whether we can make a clinical diagnosis? Oh, I think by taking very careful history of the person, 
understanding their comorbidities, if they've had previous acute attacks, but mostly it's through the GP or rheumatologist or rheumatology nursing who will come up with, uh, I should really say the rheumatologist will come up with the diagnosis through a criteria they use. There's a criteria which has been um, validated by two big rheumatology organizations, one the American College of Rheumatology, the other the European League Against Rheumatism, and in the UK you've got the BSR, the British Society of Rheumatology. So they, they have a criteria, but a lot of it is based upon the microscope and mm. coming up with a, a diagnosis. But there's also other criteria they use, but I think that's from a, a rheumatology perspective rather than from ourselves as podiatrists. Yeah. Can I just ask you, like, I, I, my assumption is that most rheumatologists just stick a needle in the joint and take the crystal, take the fluid out and have a look at it. Um, and at the GP level, that wouldn't happen. But yeah. at the GP level, if you got your clinical suspicion, you put them on the drugs, they get better. Well, does it need to go any further than that? Um, like, like, should a rheumatologist make, see them? I, I, personally, because I've worked with rheumatologists for mm. many, many years, my, 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 my own thoughts are it should be through rheumatologists. Yeah. Mm. But that's a personal opinion. Yeah, but if, if the diagnosis is pretty clear and made by the GP, based yes. on the clinical history and the drugs D does it really need to or i i, I just I, um you're just as, you're hoping yeah. that you know that it it, it is gout that they're dealing with um yeah because well, there is I'm, another I'm a... <laughs> there is another crystal arthropathy i use the word arthropathy it's, it's calcium oh god i always get my up. it's calcium pyrite pyrite pyrophosphate pyrite yeah pyrophosphate which mimics gout but there is, you know, the incidence of that is not as high as, as in gout. And there was a question about pseudo gout. So I'm guessing we've covered, I've just crossed that one off yeah. my list now. You've just yeah, covered yeah. that one for us. Perfect. Yeah. Brilliant. You're, you're, you're killing it here. This is great. Um, sorry, Craig, go on. I interrupted you. Oh, no, no. Look, I was just going to say, there are a lot of questions coming in, but I'm, I'm, I'm not mentioning them because they're sort of out of sequence to where we're going. I think maybe let's okay. just keep going and then we'll come back to any we might not have covered. So sorry if Perfect. we don't get to everyone's question. Yep. There are, are a lot coming in. Which My is... internet connection is particularly sketchy this evening. So yeah. I've, 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 uh, I've not got the questions in front of me at all. My, my, I've just turned off my laptop so that I can reduce my bandwidth. So keep an eye on those, Craig, and we'll get to them. Actually, the end. Keith, yeah. it, it, it says a lot about the topic that people are asking so many questions. We have some topics that are interesting, but people don't ask questions about, but they're asking questions about gout. But we will try and get to people's questions. If not, we'll do it in the comments later. Or we'll, or we'll bend Keith's arm and get him to come back for a part two. Um, Keith, so someone presents in clinic let's say we have a suspicion that, 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 that we have gout in front of us. This is a, an exquisitely tender, red inflamed uh, first MTPJ, let's say. Are there any very important differentials that we need to be mindful of? I think it's like with many of these, and I, I, I'll clump them together as called inflammatory arthritic conditions, which people should be aware of. And you, you do have um, rheumatoid arthritis is, is your, your, your classical one. But you've got to be aware that rheumatoid arthritis is more what we describe as polyarticular, i.e. affects more than one joint. But that, that, I'm not saying that gout only affects only one joint. It could affect other joints as well. And particularly when you get the chronic stage of gout, the chronic to faces, because they'll get it in a number of joints in the foot as well as the knee and in the fingers as well. So people have got to be aware of which condition they're dealing with. So could it be septic arthritis? Uh, I doubt it. Again, again, it would be other signs which may give that away. Could it be related to cirrhotic arthritis? Um, another, um, I won't say common condition, but has similar, you know, similar pain um, levels. So there are a number of inflammatory arthritic conditions which could be 
looking like gout, but it may not be gout. And I think you have to have a very good history taking of the person in front of you to come up with, you know, what condition are you, are you dealing with? But I think by, you know, looking at their, their history of previous episodes, I think gives it away, gives it away. I think that's the, the biggest clue of what is actually happening. Perfect. So we'll fast forward and we'll make an assumption that we have a confirmed um, gouty uh, episode, a patient with gout in front of us. Can we talk a bit to the management of, of this? And we can obviously segregate this up. First of all, uh, we've already touched on the medical management of this. Um, yes. A question that was emailed into me before uh, before we went live a, a couple of days ago was um, some people they see on gout are given uh, NSAIDs, uh, where, you know, usually naproxen, indomethacin, whereas others are put on allopurinol. Um, it, just talk me through, you know, some of the decisions with given your work with with rheumatology departments. Some of the decisions on what what may where where a rheumatologist or a prescriber may land and why. Okay. I'll talk because it's, um, I talk from what the British Society of Rheumatology recommend. And I think that's a good starting point because we're in a UK audience. Obviously, Craig in Australia and those people around the world, but there may be slightly different approaches on what actually happens. I think what most rheumatologists come up with around the world is a treat to target strategy. I, they're always trying to reduce the, the serum urate levels. They're trying to ensure that they reduce the number of flares which occur in, in the body and also try to regress the tophus. I try to reduce or the, the tophus itself. So when a person has an acute attack, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories is recommended. Colchicine, which has been around for donkey's years as, as, an, as another method of, of trying to reduce the acute attack. In, intra-articular steroids have been used. I've seen it with rheumatologists use it, uh, particularly in the knee, wherever they've had an attack in the knee, use that. Um, Allopropanol has, is, or can be used in conjunction with the others, but allopropanol is one of those urate lure low in therapy drugs which is used for someone normally with with chronic gout but it doesn't necessarily prevent the person having allopropanol when they have an, an acute attack really it's trying to prevent the gout attack when allopropanol is used now some people do get adverse effects with with allopropanol very rare but they do actually get it because it works via the kidney those people who have chronic kidney disease are not recommended to have allopropanol. And there's a newer drug on the market called uh, Febiosat, which works via the liver and has less side effects than allopropanol. But allopropanol is probably the number one drug taken for prevention of gout attacks. And it's for life. What and about, that's where people uh, misconcept that idea that allopropanol should only be taken when they have an attack. It really is a tablet which is that if you take it continuously, is that you shouldn't, in theory, have an agouse attack. Yeah, but um, I've had a number of comments over the years about colchicine being a really good diagnostic aid. If you someone has, and I know for one of those midfoot cases I had, it fixed it within about 12 hours. Um, you know, if you have your suspected gout, you put them on colchicine for a couple of days. If it gets better, it's probably gout. Now, I'm not saying I agree with that, but these are the co comments I've heard a number of times over the years. So it's actually really good as a diagnostic one. And that's exactly what I managed to organize for one of the, my midfoot, those midfoot pains. And it, subsequent to the colchicine fixing it, Further investigations reveal, yeah, that probably was gout. Um, so it's, it's, but my under, also understanding my gout can, the, sorry, the culture scene can have some pretty nasty side effects. So mm -hmm. therefore, you use it in the short term as a diagnostic aid. Um, so I just wonder if, if you comment on that. Um, I must confess the, the the amount of patients I've seen with culture scene is very few. Mm -hmm. 
So the majority of patients, and this is my experience in New Zealand, I, you know, people in Australia or USA or UK may have a different experience. Most people we were treating with gout in New Zealand were on allopurinol. Yeah, and they started off with very, very low, low dosage, and then they worked up to a higher yeah. dose yeah. because yeah. they don't know the, what happens because of the issue with the kidney. Yeah, no, I, think, I, mean, I agree. I hardly see anyone who's on it, but the, I think the comment was as a very short term assistance in making the diagnosis was what it was really good for, um, especially in those that, you know, is this gout or not? Not really sure. You know, like. Yeah. Um, um, we've talked about TOFI enough to, to bring them into the discussion. We know that we can sometimes get associated ulcerations. Um, mm. So while we're talking about management, could we just touch on whether we manage tophaceous ulcers in, in any different way to other ulcers, other foot ulcers that we see? Yeah. Um, we, I, I was very fortunate that when I was in New Zealand, I worked with a, a, an excellent rheumatology team which comprised of rheumatologists and physios, nurses, and podiatrists as well. Uh, the podiatrists were trained in diabetes and had many years of experience in, in diabetes, but they also worked in our rheumatology clinics as well. And we experienced quite a few patients with ulcerative toe fire uh, on the lesser toes. And one way of treating it was that, and I actually observed this, and I was oh, really surprised, was that they actually was debrided. Actually, the actual TOFI was debrided. Now, when I did a presentation in Australia a few years ago, um, and I said, this is how our clinicians work, and I actually had photos of what we actually did. They, they were a little bit horrified because they weren't allowed to actually remove the TOFI. Because if you think what TOFI are, they're actually impeding healing. And therefore that ulcerative lesion would, was always going to be there and could potentially develop secondary infections. So they removed it and then they treated it as like a, a diabetic ulcer and used the appropriate dressings, wound dressings to healing, for healing to occur. But it was interesting, most of them we saw or we, we actually, or they actually treated were on the lesser toes. And it was, um, we, we wrote an article up about it, although we only saw seven or eight patients and all of them had lesser toe ulcerations. And particularly, and I don't know why, and always made me think the third toe in particular, the apex of the third toe. Why the third toe? You could make some assumptions, could be due to footwear, could be, uh, we don't know. But that's by observation, that's what we found, and that's how it was treated. Australia may have a different perspective on that, and I'd be interested when you know, your colleagues wake up in the morning, Craig, their views on. Yeah. There's, <laughs> a couple, there's a couple of them there now, I noticed. I've noticed a oh, couple. Right. <laughs> Good morning to all of our <laughs> colleagues in Australia. Um, Let's talk about footwear and, and also mm. under that umbrella, foot orthoses. Uh, yes. Still, still on the theme of, of management of, of you know of, of the gouty patient, so to speak. Yeah. Footwear considerations, foot orthoses considerations. Obviously, it'll be contextual depending on the exact case. But any any sort of umbrella approaches that you can uh, speak to? More than umbrella, we've conducted about two or three big, uh, clinical trials on footwear in people with gout. Um, what we have found that um, through a, a number of different approach, approaches, oh, thank you, yep, there's a couple of clinical ones as well there, thank you for that, um, is that um, we found that a certain footwear characteristic is appropriate for people with chronic to face with scouts. Now, I'm not going to go for a particular brand because I think that is unfair, but I'll go and talk about the certain characteristics which we felt or which we feel is ideal for people with gout. Really, they should have good shock absorbing properties, good midsole stability, 
they should have a rocker system within the shoe and if possible a wide toe box with a good flexion point at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint and it should be laced up or a zip so a good walking shoe is your classical example and what we found in our trials is that it did reduce a lot of the impairment and disability and pain in those individuals thank you thank you for that craig I'll, I'll link to it in the in the comments for people who want to follow it up <laughs> yeah yeah so from footwear we felt was a very important factor but a factor which was even more important and this has really been emphasized in the evidence and the most recent evidence is that patient education was a key pivotal point for success not only in our footwear trials but in other trials as well gout or i should say nurse-led education and podiatry-led education as well is an, an essential component to how we manage people with gout if we reinforce what gout is about what may cause gout how to prevent gout have a good lifestyle make sure that you take the appropriate medications when you um, when it's needed that you look after yourself those are key important characteristics and features and we've reinforced that in our clinical trials and maybe not only the footwear became an important component but it's the whole issue of promotion of good health foot health but also health within the individual themselves yeah brilliant um i'm conscious that we have a lot of private practitioners uh, that watch out our episodes so uh, i know that we've sort of gone through the journey of what gout is what causes it what what it presents like um how we diagnose it some of the differentials some of the management so i'd like to think we give them some of the, the listeners the audience that the journey so to speak but could you just sort of summarize for the, the the private practitioner who has a raised index of suspicion in their clinic uh, that i'm dealing with i'm potentially dealing with gout here how should they uh, sort of manage that what should their thought process be their their pathway or how should they escalate that okay i think we're I'm making the assumption that this person hasn't been diagnosed or has been diagnosed uh, hasn't uh, let's say yeah has let's say not, hasn't, has not, yeah well, has not been diagnosed if you suspect that this person has gout then i would strongly recommend they refer them to their own pp in the first instance to get further investigations because you want to make sure that you are dealing with gout in the first instance and not any other suspicious uh, case or conditions that you're dealing with once it comes back then hopefully that person would be um, either given medication or seen by the nurse for education but the role of the podiatrist because it has a, a prevalence a high prevalence in the foot is that we as podiatrists have a very big role to play to ensure that good footwear perhaps foot orthosis for people i mean there's no evidence at the moment for which type of foot, foot orthosis will do but if you're dealing with a, a chronic foot condition and you've got very limited range of movement then soft cushioned insoles would be probably the ideal situation for, for those individuals and managing that person to make sure that they're adhering to what has been described or talked about by their nurse or by their gp reinforcing the gout education there are excellent gout educational societies around the world I know in New Zealand we had arthritis New Zealand and I work very closely with them I know in Australia Australia um, arthritis is, is very good and there's versus versus arthritis in the UK and there's the gout uric acid society in America who we who we've done work with so I know there's some very good voluntary service out there with lots and lots of information and if there are four patients then you could refer them to any of those societies and they will be happy to pass on leaflets and information and they have groups that work together for those individuals it's all about trying to change the lifestyle the perception of gout this horrible perception of gout is that you think of the old man 
sitting in the chair, going back to an hour ago, drinking the port, having his foot up, you know, bandaged up. At the end of the day, that's a completely misconception of what gout is about. It's got a bad press. It's got a really bad press. Yeah. And we're trying um, to change that image. We'll just give a quick plug uh, before we ask Craig to, to go dive into the questions. We'll just give a quick plug for a, a CPD insert that we know you've got coming up in the UK with, with Anita Williams, just because we've all, as you've just said, knowing what a good history taking looks like, knowing what these clinical features are and knowing, you know, when and how to educate is, 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 is clearly key. Um, when can we expect, where and when can we expect your, your free CPD that's going to really kind of um, help us get there? Um, I hope sometime this year, obviously with the crisis which is happening, everything is put on hold. So I'm hoping sometime this year that will happen. And I'm trying to do the same for our colleagues in Australia to see if I can use that same kind of information for CPD for people in Australia as well. So hopefully and this will, be, this will be in the College of Podiatry? Uh, in Podiatry in now. Right now, right. now, yeah, free pre insert. Perfect. So keep our eyes peeled for that, which is great. Yep. Um, Craig, yeah, look, looking at the time, I reckon we got time for a few questions, have we? Yeah, look, I, I've, sorry, I've just lost the questions. I'm just bringing them back up. Um, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to remember some. Oh, here we go. Oh, hang on. I've now got the audio. Sorry, I've just. Um, like a lot of the questions were quite narrow and specific and I think what I'll do Keith is I'm going to ha and I hate to do this to you I'm going to have to convince you to, to sign up to Facebook um, no, <laughs> <never>. <laughs> and no, if you could come my, if you wife could, and I said, my, my wife and I said we said we never do Twitter or Facebook sorry yeah because um, <laughs> it would be really good if you so some of the, the the questions are quite quite narrow and quite specific which would just require a yes no why don't, Craig why don't we cut and paste them send them to Keith in an email we'll reply okay, okay. Um, so yeah, and then just, with his we can post his replies on the on the page how did that sound yeah, okay, that's a we can compromise. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just so everyone knows, the re the reason I get a bit anxious when the hour comes up is that when we we can keep going as long as we like, but when we convert this to a podcast, the podcast systems only allow one hour maximum, or we've got to make it into a part two. So we don't really want a part one and a part two unless we come back and do it another day. Um, so I, I think this, you know, where we are just under the hour now. So look, so thanks so much, Keith. It's 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 gone really well. I have noticed a lot from Australia just joining in. They're obviously getting out of bed in the morning. Um, for, for those who have just joined us and don't know, if you come back in about 10, 15 minutes, the whole replay will be there. It did take about an hour last week. So there's a, obviously some holdups that will be on YouTube later today and then the podcast version. So, look, so again, so thanks so much, Keith. It's been really good. Um, I think we've, we've covered a lot. Um, so Thank you, Keith. found it useful. Good. Thank you. Well, I, I hope everyone enjoyed it, and I, hopefully I could, I've answered all the questions to my best ability. So some questions were a little bit uh, out there a little bit, but uh, hopefully I've answered them <laughs> in the most appropriate no, way. Okay, so brilliant. thanks very much, Keith.